We are finally here. We are at the precipice of this story in God of War 3. Both giant characters, being Zeus and Kratos, are about to put an end to the feud, but only one can survive. Who is going to win? Let's get into it and also answer the question, is this the perfect ending to the story that has been told across the span of this series? Kratos, who was once a mere mortal man, has now been labelled as many things like the ghost of Sparta and death itself. Zeus, frightened of sharing the same fate of his father and the father before him, is doing everything he can to put an end to the unstoppable force that is Kratos. God of War 3 would depart from the previous limitations of the PS2 console and be heavily upgraded across all facets, making the newer, more powerful PS3 its debut console. This upgrade allowed Santa Monica more freedom to fully realize their vision in concluding this epic tale and making a final bookend to Kratos taking down the Greek gods. But this was easier said than done. Making the leap from the PS2 to the PS3 was no walk in the park. In fact, it was probably one of the most complicated things that could have been done to this entire game series. Everything's new. It's so much more involved. PlayStation 3 were able to push a lot more polygons, a lot more texture resolution and detail. So things are hyper realistic. I mean, they're, they're so realistic now that we can actually see pores on skin and, and hair and eyebrows and nose hairs. You can see everything. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Every character now is like taking six weeks, eight yeah, weeks. Maybe six weeks. Yeah, to make one. It's not like before, it's like five days we can make one. You basically had to relearn how to create a game on an entirely new console. The expectations were so much higher, not only because this was the third installment to a very tried, proven and beloved franchise, but everyone's expectations grew immensely as to what would be possible on the PS3. So we get it, everything is bigger and better, more polygons, more details, but did this game act as the perfect ending for the franchise? Did it not only fulfill the expectations of the fans, but did it once again elevate the game series just like the first two games did as well? For me, you bet your ass it did. My god, this is my absolute all-time favorite God of War game, so let me tell you why. Story-wise, we start off right where God of War 2 ends. You are riding on the back of Gaia and you are surrounded by the other titans that you picked up from the previous timeline. The opening of this game instantly draws you in as you ascend on Mount Olympus heading toward the gods to take them down. Poseidon, one of the first bosses you ever come across in this game, sets the absolute standard as to how action-packed, raw and gruesome this game will be. Now one of the biggest differences you'll notice in this boss fight and also the boss fight seen throughout this game compared to the first two is how much verticality plays into these new fights. The levels, the platforms and everything in your interactions with characters shifts on a vertical level. It means that the game has a much much larger scale and you really get to see how small Kratos is in comparison to these giant beings that he's taken down. After an absolutely astonishing fight with Poseidon, the developers cleverly use the L3 and R3 buttons to simulate you pushing your thumbs into the eye sockets of Poseidon himself. Poseidon is quickly disposed of and you see the very, very real impact of killing a god. And this game does not shy away from letting you kill all the gods. It's kill after kill after kill after kill after kill, you get it. But the difference here is that every boss encounter isn't just some big hulking monster or some seamless god. Everything feels so much more personal. Hell, some of the gods that you defeat in this game helped you out in the previous two games as well. Everything has that personal touch, that personal relationship or bond that somehow, somewhere along the timeline, they have interacted with Kratos. So taking them down just feels even more brutal. It felt way more emotional, impactful, and the deaths caused by you felt ever more purposeful. Killing Poseidon causes the sea levels to rise, engulfing and flooding the lands of the world. Zeus throws a giant thunderbolt at Gaia and sends her and Kratos off the mountain. 
Kratos, not being able to get a grip on Gaia, is told that all this time he has been a pawn in the Titans game against the God. A vessel to advance their motives rather than a true partnership between Kratos and the Titans. Kratos is bucked off Gaia and eventually finds himself in the underworld, being stripped of his powers and weapons in the River Styx. You lose the Blade of Olympus, the Blades of Athena are severely damaged, and you're basically left with nothing. Athena, having ascended to a higher plane of existence after sacrificing herself for Zeus, gifts Kratos with the Blades of Exile, and tells Kratos to extinguish the Flame of Olympus. Zeus will not fall as easily as Ares. To destroy the King of the Gods, you must seek the source of his strength, the Flame of Olympus. Now as I just said before, you do lose a lot of your items and abilities in the River Styx, and just like God of War 2 did, it gives the game the opportunity to introduce you to even more weapons and abilities to the players, however this is where I have a little bit of a gripe with the game, it's a nitpick, the nittiest of nitpicks if you will. <laughs> So you get another iteration of the blades from the first and second game. You get the Blades of Exile. And this is kind of like the Blades of Chaos or the Blades of Athena. They basically do the exact same thing, which is fine, that's his main weapon, whatever. It is a blade on a chain weapon. You'll also unlock the Claws of Hades that help you raise the souls of the underworld. But hold on a minute, this is also just a blade-like weapon attached to a chain. So you have the Claws of Hades and then you have the Blades of Exile, both are blades on a chain. Okay, next weapon. So another weapon that you unlock is a Nemesis Whip, which is shit, it's another blade on a chain kind of weapon. Fuck, really? Another one? So this means that in this game, three out of your four main weapons that you unlock is some kind of iteration of a blade on a chain. Now granted, they do all have different elements, which then align themselves with different movesets. However, because they are all quite similar physically, they all kind of play in a very, very similar fashion. You also do get these giant gauntlets, which are the most different that you'll unlock in this game. They make Kratos play incredibly differently. He is so much slower. He's a lot more vulnerable to hits because of how slow he is. But when your hit lands, you are basically unstoppable. These weapons also play a much larger role in the level designs and puzzles too, which is greatly appreciated. There would often be moments where you would need to circle back to certain areas once you've unlocked the gauntlets to break onyx, which is a type of rock, or use the nemesis whip to charge certain platforms. Changes like these made the weapons feel far more useful and really added to the immersion, whereas they could have just simply been limited to this thingy chops off the head of that thingy. Each of these weapons also come with their unique magic attack which essentially channels the main crux or essence of that weapon into an ability. For example, the Claws of Hades has a soul summon to summon spirits. The gauntlets create an earthquake, the whips shock those around you and the Blades of Exile creates a shield. It's very interesting and a great addition. Now this wouldn't be a God of War game without some additional items. You get the Bow of Apollo, which is similar to the bow you got in God of War 2. You unlock the Head of Helios, which you can use to blind enemies and reveal hidden secrets. And the Boots of Hermes, which turn you into a basically wish version of the Flash. Now my nitpick also extends to these additional items or abilities that you unlock as well. Again, it's a nitpick. I still love the game, it's my favourite, but it's a nitpick nevertheless. The new items that you get in this game are very, very similar to the ones that you have in God of War 2. So swapping out the ones from God of War 2 and replacing them with God of War 3 seems somewhat unnecessary. You lose your bow in God of War 2, which is Typhon's Bane, only to gain the bow of Apollo, which acts identical. It's the same thing. You then lose the head of Ural, which incapacitates your enemies by turning them to stone, and then is swapped out for yet another head of someone else, but this time instead of incapacitating someone by turning them to stone, you incapacitate them by blinding them. It is a minor change, but it's still kind of the same thing. It's a head that you press the same button on, and it incapacitates your enemies in some degree. I understand you can't always have such a level of innovation and change, like from God of War 1 to God of War 2, However, 
I feel the changes made into God of War 3 felt so inconsequential. It's still extremely fun, but the new weapons and items in each new installment became a staple to the series, almost to a point where it was an expectation, something players will look forward to seeing just what new and exciting mechanics will be introduced into the next game. Okay, so back to the story. Kratos, having come out of the River Styx, will make his way through and out of the underworld in his pursuit to kill the gods of Olympus and now also Gaia, who he feels just betrayed him. He will kill Hades, he kills Helios, he kills Hermes, Hephaestus, basically everything and everyone you come into contact with in this game is going to die at your hands at some point. This is a Kratos that is completely unchained. Haha, <laughs> you get it? Unchained? Because it's chains. Shh, fucking hell. He is finally closing in on his desires to destroy Olympus. His anger fuels him, and the ferocity of that anger was only made more damaging when Gaia bucked Kratos off in his mind an act of betrayal. It is Kratos against the gods and Kratos against the titans. Pandora is the key to extinguishing the flames that we mentioned before, and you see Kratos care for Pandora on multiple levels. He once mistakes her for his own daughter at one stage, and she acts as a constant reminder to him of the terrible deeds that he has done, a constant reminder of the monster that he has turned himself into. On another level, she also acts as his salvation, his escape from this hell. She is used as a vessel to not only ground and show the humanity behind Kratos, but gives him a glimmer of hope. Whoa, hope. Just remember that word. We're going to have a full circle moment in the video very, very shortly. Just write that down. Write hope, 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 hope. Write it down. Here we go. <laughs> so Kratos and Zeus fight multiple times. Kratos eventually loses Pandora and almost loses his own life. Moments before his own death, Kratos is taken on a mental journey which is guided by Pandora's spirit. And on this journey, you are taken through the most prolific, memorable, and heart-achingly painful memories that Kratos has. The memories that shape him, that define him, and it's through this journey that he can finally forgive himself for his own past actions. Kratos regains consciousness and ends the reign of the gods by killing Zeus. Athena appears and informs Kratos that the fears and evils that were placed in Pandora's box were influencing the gods, especially Zeus. Now I said fears, and I also said fearful when I was discussing God of War 2. This was very deliberate. Zeus was afraid of Kratos, and the evils that were released when Kratos opened Pandora's box, which attached itself to Zeus, emphasized that fear. The evil was in fact fear personified. To counteract those evils, one of the most powerful weapons in the world was placed alongside it. What was that weapon? You got it. It was hope. Whoa, full circle moment. Hope is what makes us strong. It is why we are here. It is what we fight with when all else is lost. By forgiving himself of his past deeds and having absorbed the hope that was also locked within Pandora's box, Kratos was able to get his powers back when fighting Zeus. His guilt and torment were suppressing this power of hope all this time. Athena, who placed the hope in the box, demanded that Kratos return this power. Athena wanted to rebuild the world under her rule, utilizing the power of hope. However, as the fear and evils bonded with the gods, so too did the powers of hope bond to Kratos. Hope was now infused with Kratos. Athena demands again, however Kratos refuses once more. Kratos impales himself with the blade of Olympus, thus releasing the power of hope back into the world. Instead of giving this power to one being, he shared the gift of hope with mankind. Now some don't like that story, some think that hope is a little bit on the nose, but I actually quite like it. And it, it enables Kratos as a character to finally forgive himself. Throughout the entire series, Kratos has been wanting to get rid of the memories of the transgressions and the bad things that he has done throughout the entire story being told. And finally, we see Kratos at a point where he can forgive himself for what he's done. He doesn't forget, but he finally forgives himself. I think that's a really, really great story. 
Now we do think that Kratos is dead, but we eventually see a blood trail leading off the cliff, which tells the players that his story is not yet over. So overall, this game was truly a masterpiece in my opinion. It was far more cinematic in its execution. Every single boss encounter was like a personal battle where Kratos is finally ripping off the shackles one at a time with every execution. The level designs have never been bigger nor more interactive than any other God of War game that has come before this. Visually, the game was absolutely phenomenal for the time and even holds up to today's standard. Combat was fluid, tight and extremely responsive. Despite some of the weapons and items being a reskin of past games, they still made for hours of fun and gave the players many ways to defeat your foes in what I'd say is probably the most satisfying combat system across any of the God of War games. I know people have an affinity to the newer God of War games, but hey, my personal opinion, my video, make your own. <laughs> and then the story, my god, the story. Finally getting that conclusion where Kratos, after all these years, can finally put an end to his torment, can finally exact his revenge on those who have been plaguing him, who have been manipulating him, and a conclusion where Kratos can finally rest. This game, not without its issues, acted as the perfect conclusion for me. It felt like such a refined experience. There was no fluff. Everything in this game served a purpose, whether it was to be the vessel to forward the narrative, to act as an emotional piece for Kratos, or just show the players how far the technology has advanced across all facets with the jump from the PS2 over to the PS3. God of War 3 was an exceptional game and a phenomenal conclusion to one of, if not the best story to ever be told on any gaming system. But guys, that is it for the series. I hope you liked it. I hope you made it the whole way through. And I also want to thank the copy supporters on the screen right now. If you did like the series, please go ahead, leave the video a like, sub to the channel, and let me know what game series you'd like me to tackle next. Again, I want to thank you so much for the support I've been getting over these videos. It's been amazing. I've had a lot of fun making them, but um, that's it for today's video, guys, and I'll catch you in the next one.